Hello, everybody. Welcome to Jesus and Coffee Conversations. If this is your first time, welcome. If it's not your first time, welcome back. Today is the day for the Pride video. Uh, so make sure that you have your Bibles. You will need them. Make sure you also have your pens, your journals, of course, your coffee. I am drinking water today because um, I am taking a little short coffee break. You guys know I do that from time to time. So yeah, let's go ahead and jump right in. So I'm going to give you the definition first. And it's from Google and it's defined as a feeling or deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements. The achievements of those with whom one is closely associated or from qualities or possessions that are wide, widely admired. And pride is a sin. So it's something that got the devil kicked out of heaven. And that was the very first sign of pride was is when Lucifer, um, you know, rebelled against God. And let's look at those scriptures first. So the first scripture is going to come from Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. I mean, through 15, I'm sorry. And I'm actually going to read these scriptures to you today. Um, this video, I might end up having to split it into two parts. I'm not sure yet because I really want you guys to fully grasp um what i'm trying to get you to understand about pride and why it's so dangerous um so yeah make sure that you are following along in your bible i really recommend that you do just so that you can see it for yourself and you know that i'm not just sitting here you know telling you guys whatever um so it's really important that anytime even in church that you always have your bible so that you can follow along with whoever is speaking because there are a lot of people that would put, put their own spin on it or they'll twist it or what have you. So you want to make sure that you're following along with them to make sure that they are indeed telling you what God's word says. So again, it is Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 through 15. And I am reading from the Living Translation. Uh, 14, 12. Let me get there myself. Okay. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, mighty though you were against the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and rule the angels. I will take the highest throne. I will preside on the mount of assembly far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. But instead, you will be brought down to the pit of hell, down to its lowest depths. So right there, we can see where Lucifer got the big head. And he was one of the most beautiful angels that God created. And, you know, he had like his body was made out of all these beautiful instruments and stones and, you know, just all of those things. And so he was a very beautiful angel. And I don't know what happened. I guess he must have, you know, saw himself in the mirror one day and was, you know, stricken by his own beauty because he got the big head and thought that he should be God and that the angels should be worshiping him instead of the true God. And so, you know, his heart filled with pride. It filled with um, jealousy. It filled with hatred and anger and just all of those things. And, you know, God was like, no, you are not me i am the only true god and i'm about to prove it to you so there was the big war in heaven and you know that um uh, michael and the other angels kicked the devil and the fallen angels out of heaven um and so that is what happened to the devil when he got the big head and i have another scripture um in ezekiel chapter 28 verses 12 through 15. And again, it's Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 15. My pages are set together. Okay, 12 through 15. And it reads, Son of dust, weep for the king of Tyre. Tell him, the Lord God says, you were the perfection of wisdom and beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was bejeweled with every precious stone. Ruby, topaz, diamond, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, sapphire, 
carbuncle and emerald, all in beautiful settings of finest gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. I appointed you to be the anointed guardian angel. You had access to the holy mountain of God. You walked among the stones of fire. You were perfect in all you did from the day you were created until that time when wrong was found in you. And here, God is talking to Ezekiel about the devil and how beautiful he was until that pride got in him and he wanted to be God. And so, you know, pride is a dangerous thing. And there are a lot of people walking around here that are full of pride. And there were a lot of people in the Bible that were full of pride as well. And pride comes from the devil. It is a sin against God. And God does not want us to have any part of that. That is why he always tells us to be humble. Um, so I'm going to go to Proverbs 16, verse 18. And Proverbs talks a lot about pride as well. And again, it's Proverbs 16, verse 18. And it reads, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. So that's why if you see people that are like really prideful, um, you need to be weary of those people because when they get so prideful and so built up, you know, in who they are and all they've done and all of that, destruction, their downfall is not far behind that. And the devil is a perfect example. Like he got full of pride and, you know, all of that, he got kicked out of heaven not too long after that. So anytime that you see people, you know, especially like in Hollywood, when you see people with money and power and all of that, and then all of a sudden they're on the news because they're being exposed for something, more than likely pride has something to do with that exposure. So God is not going to let you stay prideful for long, whether you're, you know, a sinner, but definitely not if you claim to be a child of God. He is not going to let you remain prideful for long. So you might, you know, be on your high horse for a little bit, but God is going to knock you off that horse and everybody is going to see it. And then I'm going to read Proverbs 8, verse 13. Eight, Proverbs 8, verse 13. And it reads, If anyone respects and fears God, he will hate evil. For wisdom hates pride, arrogance, corruption, and deceit of every kind. So now I'm going to get into some people in the Bible who were full of pride. And I'm going to start, I'm going to try to go in order so that I don't have you like flipping all through the Bible. Um, so we will start with King Isaiah first. And King Isaiah is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. And I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's not that long. But like I said, I really want to read these scriptures so that you guys can, you know, get it for yourself and really understand, like, how important being humble is. Like, because, you know, people... They are crying out to God and want God to bless, him, bless them and, you know, all of that. And then when God does, they forget all about him. And then they're acting like they did everything on their own, that they got where they are on their own, that they have the things that they have because it's all the work that they did. And they forget about God. They take God out of the picture. And that is a huge problem. So that is why um, the Holy Spirit really put it on my heart to do a study about pride because there are a lot of people in the body of Christ that are uh, prideful and that are starting to leave God out of the picture. And it can lead a lot of people astray when, you know, they aren't recognizing God for blessing them with all the things that they have because at the end of the day it's about God it's not about us yes God is blessing you know people he doesn't mind blessing you with you know money he doesn't mind blessing you with houses and cars and health and you know all the things that you want but it's not for you to get the glory it's for God to get the glory it's for you to tell people that look God did this for me he can do it for you God does not want you struggling God doesn't want you you know dying from disease and all of this stuff like God loves you and is merciful and he blessed me he can bless you too that is really what it's supposed to be about a testimony about god but a lot of people make it about them and so they get caught up 
you know, and having the money and people, you know, everybody knowing who they are and all of that. And that's why I always say it's not about me. Like I do these videos and the things that I do because I really want to help people. It's not so that everybody, I honestly <laughs> do care less about people knowing who I am. Uh, so I'm not doing it for fame. I'm not doing it for money. Like I'm doing it because God told me to do it so that I can reach people to expand his kingdom. Like, so it is not about me at all. But anyway, getting back to King Isaiah. Um, and again, this is 2 Chronicles chapter 26. So we're going to read about him and how pride um, destroyed his life. So 2 Chronicles chapter 26. The people of Judah now crowned 16-year-old Isaiah as their new king. So here we see that he was very young when he became king. After his father's death, he rebuilt the city of Eloth and restored it to Judah. In all, he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name, and these are Hebrew names, so if I mess it up, I'm sorry. His mother's name was Jecolia from Jerusalem. He followed in the footsteps of his father, Amaziah, and was in general a good king in the Lord's sight. While Zechariah was alive, Isaiah was always eager to please God. Zechariah was a man who had special revelations from God, and as long as the king followed the paths of God, he prospered, for God blessed them. So I'm going to stop right there. Anytime, this also in Proverbs, if you commit your ways to God, then your steps will be established. So anytime that you commit what you are doing to God, meaning you give it back to him and you say, okay, God, you know, yes, I want to, you know, own my own real estate company. So I'm going to give you my real estate company. You do what you want to do with it. So when you give it to God and you keep God first in your life, God is going to prosper you and bless you and see that what you're doing is successful as long as you obey him and stay in right standing with him. Verse 6, he declared war, and this is King Isaiah, he declared war on the Philistines and captured the city of Gath and broke down its walls, also those of Jabana and Ashdod. Then he built new cities in the Ashdod area and in other parts of the Philistine country. God helps him not only with his wars against the Philistines, but also in his battles with the Arabs, of Gerbal and in his wars with the Mennonites. The Ammonites paid annual tribute to him and his fame spread even to Egypt for he was very powerful. He built fortified towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and the valley gate and at the turning of the wall. He also constructed forts in the Negev and made many water reservoirs for he had great herds of cattle out in the valleys and on the plains. He was a man who loved the soil and had many farms and vineyards, both on the hillsides and in the fertile valleys. He organized his army into regiments to whom to regimes, I'm sorry, to which men were drafted under quotas set by Geo, the secretary of the army, and his assistant Messiah. The commander in chief was General Hananiah. Twenty six hundred brave clan leaders commanded these regiments. The army consisted of 307,500 men, all elite troops. Isaiah issued to them shields, spears, helmets, coats of mail, bows, and sling stones. And he produced engines of war manufactured in Jerusalem, invented by brilliant men to shoot arrows and huge stones from the towers and battlements. So he became very famous, for the Lord helped him wonderfully until he was very powerful. So everything that King Isaiah had and did was because God was with him and was blessing him because he was in right standing with God until he became very powerful. Verse 16, but at that point, so after he had all this stuff and his fame was spread across the land and he became very powerful, then he became proud and corrupt. So there we see that the moment that he got powerful and had all this stuff, he then turned away from God because he became proud and then that proud led to corruption. He sinned against the Lord his God by entering the forbidden sanctuary 
of the temple and personally burning incense upon the altar. So we know that in God's kingdom, there is an order to everything. So nobody is supposed to go in the temple and light incense or do anything like that except for the priests. But King Isaiah got the big head and was like, I am king. I am powerful. I can do whatever it is that I want to do. So I'm going to go in the sanctuary and I'm going to burn this incense because I can. And that is a sin or was a sin against God because he was out of line. He was out of order. Verse 7, 18. Azariah, the high priest, went in after him with 80 other priests, all brave men, and demanded that he get out. It is not for you, Isaiah, to burn incense, they declared. That is the work of the priests alone, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to this work. Get out, for you have trespassed, and the Lord is not going to honor you for this. Verse 19, Isaiah was furious, so he had the audacity to get mad at them because they were telling him, that you might be king, but you were not ordained by God to be up in here to do what you're trying to do. Um, verse 8, 19. Isaiah was furious and refused to set down the incense burner he was holding. But look, suddenly leprosy appeared on his forehead. When Azariah and the others saw it, they rushed him out. In fact, he himself was as anxious to get out as they were to get him out because the Lord had struck him. So because he sinned against God and he got pride, pride, prideful and arrogant and upset that they were telling him he wasn't supposed to be in there, God struck him with leprosy. And back in those days, if you had leprosy, you were pretty much shunned from other people. You could not be around people. You were considered unclean. Verse 21. So King Isaiah was a leper until the day of his death and lived in isolation, cut off from his people and from the temple. So not only did he get kicked out of the temple, he got kicked out of his kingdom. Like he was in total isolation and that is how he died. So he went from, you know, being king and very powerful and having all of this stuff to having pretty much nothing and no one because of his pride. Verse 20, one, I'm going to pick up after that he was cut off from the temple. His son Jotham became vice regent, I hope I said that right, in charge of the king's affairs and of the judging of the people of the land. The other details of Isaiah's reign from first to last are recorded by the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. When Isaiah died, he was buried in the royal cemetery, even though he was a leper, and his son Jotham, or Jotham, became the new king. So there you can see that pride can make you lose every single thing that you have. He, his health got struck him because he got struck with leprosy. And then he lost all that he had because of pride. Um, so now we are going to look at someone else who was prideful. And there are different types of pride. So you have people that are, you know, prideful as in thinking that they are all of that. You got the pride of power, people that are in positions of power get prideful. You have pride of religion where people can be overly religious and think that, you know, they're doing everything right and, you know, all of that. And I will get into that. But we're going to look at Haman, who was somebody else that was prideful. And it's going to be in Esther chapter five. I'm sorry, I forgot my dog. Esther chapter five. And it's going to be verse... 11. Okay, so actually I'm going to start. Okay, I might have to back up here. I'm not going to be all of Esther, but I will kind of recap it a little bit. So Haman in the book of Esther was um, like the king's right hand man. And he was, um, I think when he got appointed to be like the king's right hand man, it was where he could go into the city and people would have to bow down to him and sing praises to him. And Mordecai, who was Jewish, would not do it because he served the true God and was like, I'm not bowing to you because you're not God. I'm not praising you because you're not God. So that made Haman very angry. And so he went to the king and had a law passed, you know, because he lied and was like, there's people, you know, and you're kingdom that are 
um, refusing to obey you and your laws and all that stuff, you know, here's this law, let's sign it, you sign it, put your, your ring sign on it to say that, you know, they have to be put to death and all that stuff. So the king was like, you know, okay. So the law got passed that the people that were, that Haman was referring to would have to be killed. And Haman wanted to kill all the Jews because of Mordecai who refused to bow down to him. So that is what I'm going to pick up. Esther chapter 5 verse, I'm going to start at 9. And this was after um, Esther, like Mordecai went to Esther and told her what was going on. And he had told her, don't tell anybody, not even the king, that you're Jewish. But then when Haman put out the law, Mordecai was like, you need to go to the king and get this reversed. And she was like, I can't do that because, you know, he has to call for me. If he doesn't call for me, then I can be killed. And Mordecai was like, you're going to die anyway with the rest of us if you don't go to him and say something. And, you know, God puts you in this position for a time as this. So she called a fast. And then after the fast, she went to the king. The king found favor with her. Um, so he held up the scepter to her and was like, what is your request? Like anything you want, you can have it. So she said, okay, I want to have this banquet for you and Haman. And so that is where it's picking up for chapter five is that um, she had requested that Haman and the king join her for supper. So <laughs> chapter five, verse nine, what a happy man was Haman as he left the banquet. But when he saw Mordecai there at the gate, not standing up or trembling before him, he was furious. Um, verse 10, however, he restrained himself, went on home and gathered together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, and boasted to them about his wealth, his many children and promotions the king had given him and how he had become the greatest man in the kingdom next to the king himself. So, and I'll just go ahead and finish this out. So Haman, you know, you read that he was boasting to his wife and his friends and saying, you know, I got all this money, I got all these kids, I got all this power, yada, 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 look at how great I am. And so there is where his pride came in. And I'm going to tell you how amazing God is. And I did a video about this, about how God will get back at your enemies and I will link it so you can go and watch it. So what? You know, Haman had like the gallows built. He was going to hang Mordecai and all the Jews on it because he was full of hatred towards them because they, because Mordecai would not bow down to him. And so as it goes, they go to the banquet, him and the king. And actually, first of all, let me back it up. So, hey, not Haman, Mordecai had prevented the king from being assassinated because he overheard two of the king's bodyguards talking about how they were planning to kill him and so one night the king could not sleep and you know he asked for like all the records and he came across it and he was like well what was done for the person that saved my life and they were like nothing so he called Haman in and asked Haman what should be done for the person you know but for you know a person I can't remember exactly what he said but how should the king honor um somebody that and I'm paraphrasing here you and that's why I say you need to read about for yourself but I can't recall what he called it exactly, but what should I do for somebody that I guess, you know, looks out for the king or something like that. And so Haman thought he was talking about him. So he told the king, you know, oh, you should get, you know, he should be on your horse. He should have your robe on. He should be, you know, ridden or walk through the city and have people, you know, seeing all these great things about him and yada, yada, yada. And so the king was like, okay, I want you to do it, but do it for Mordecai. So Haman, imagine how he felt when the king was like, you're going to do all of that, but you're going to do it for Mordecai. So that's how God worked that out. So he had to do all of that for Mordecai. And then when Esther made her request known at the banquet, she told the king, like, Haman is trying to kill me and my people. And Haman did not know that she was Jewish. And so he started begging for his life and all that. And the king was like, no, you're going to be hung on the gallows. The gallows that you have built for Mordecai and all the Jews, I'm going to hang you and your sons on those same gallows. So that is what pride will do. Pride will get you killed. Pride can get you stripped of everything. Um, and so that is what ended up happening to Haman is that he got so full of pride, you know, that he was, that everything he planned against a child of God backfired and fell on him instead. 
So the last person that we're going to look at is going to be King Nebuchadnezzar. And that is found in the book of Daniel. And it is Daniel chapter 4, verse, I have verse 30, but I'm, I don't know if I want to read the whole thing or if I just want to read verse 30. I will, I'll, I won't read the whole thing. I'll um, give you like a little bit of bad job. So Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And in the dream, he saw like this tall, beautiful tree. It had birds in the tree. It had like animals laying under it, you know, resting peacefully and all of that. And then all of a sudden, the tree got chopped down and there was nothing there. And so he could not figure out the dream. So Daniel was um, the dream interpreter because of God. And so he went to Daniel and Daniel was like, I wish that this dream was happening to somebody else and not you. So basically the tree in the dream was King Nebuchadnezzar and it was a representation of his kingdom and how powerful his kingdom was and all of this. And then his kingdom was gonna get taken away um, by God because he became prideful. So I am going to go into verse 30. And actually, Daniel gave him a warning. He said that if you do not acknowledge God, and if you don't turn away from your pride, then this is going to happen to you. So he listened to Daniel for 364 days, but on day 365, he said, forget it. It's all about me. So that's what we're going to go into. Verse 30. And it reads, if I can find it. Okay, here we go. Actually, I started verse 28. Oh, verse 29, I'm sorry. 12 months after this dream, he was strolling on the roof of the warrior palace in Babylon and saying, I, by my own mighty power, have built this beautiful city as my royal residence and as the capital of my empire. Verse 31, while he was still speaking these things, so while he was in the middle of his boasting, God called out to him and said, O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. You will be forced out of the palace to live with the animals in the fields and to eat grass like the cows for seven years until you finally realize that God parcels out the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he chooses. That very same hour, this prophecy was fulfilled. So the dream that he had was a prophecy. And we all know that when God says something, it's going to happen. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar was chased from his palace and ate grass like the cows and his body was wet with dew. His hair grew as long as eagles' feathers and his nails were like birds' claws. At the end of seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven and my sanity returned and I praised and worshipped the Most High God and honored him who lives forever, whose rule is everlasting, his kingdom evermore. All the people of the earth are nothing when compared to him. He does whatever he thinks best among the angels of heaven as well as here on earth. No one can stop him or challenge him, saying, what do you mean by doing these things? When my mind returned to me, so did my honor and glory and kingdom. My counselors and officers came back to me and I was reestablished as head of my kingdom and even great, greater honor than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the King of Heaven, the Judge of all, who whose every act is right and good, for he is able to take those who walk proudly and push them into the dust. So King Nebuchadnezzar lived like an animal for seven years. I don't know about you, but after the first couple of weeks of living like that, I think I would have got myself together and said, you know what, it's not about me, it's about you. But it took him seven years to come to his senses and realize that it is God that gives kingdoms and countries and stuff to people. It's not people that are doing it on their own. It's because God is allowing them to have those positions of power. 
and he, you know, he came to his senses and was like, okay, it's God. It's not me. It's not anybody else. It is about God and God only. He is the true God, and he is the one that deserves all the glory and all the praise and, you know, all the honor. And so that is another example of the danger of pride. So Haman and um, King Isaiah and King Nebuchadnezzar all had the pride of power. They were all drunk with power. And God had to knock them down off their high horses and say, uh-uh, you, you might be in a position of power, but you're there because I put you there and I put you there for a reason. So anytime that you see people, even down to today, the president that we have and any president that we've ever had, it's because God put them in the position. Kings and other countries are there because God put them in that position. So any, it doesn't matter. You can vote all you want to, but it's not our votes that get people into office. It's who God wants into office and God puts certain people into office so prophecies can come to pass. So um, I'm going to skip to the pride of religion. And this is found in New Testament with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And we're going to jump to Luke chapter 18, verse 10. And you know people, religious people, they get that religious prideful spirit where they think, oh, you know, I'm holier than thou because I fast, you know, ten for weeks on end and I you know, pray to God and I don't drink and I don't smoke and I don't do this and I don't do that. And they look down at other people that do that and they don't realize that everybody has their own journey to getting to where God wants them. And Jesus understood, you know, that just because you're living righteously, that does not make you any better than somebody that is sincerely comes to God, you know, with all of their mess and saying, okay, God, I messed up, but you can still use me. You can clean me. You can do, you know, work a miracle and things in me. God's not looking for people that are perfect and have it all together. So that's why Jesus was like, you don't need, you that are well don't need a physician. It's the people that are sick that I'm here for. I'm not here for you people that think you got yourself all together. And maybe you do have yourself together. I'm here for the ones that don't have themselves together to let them know that they can come to me the way that they are and I will be the one to change their heart and their lifestyle, you know, and all of that. So Luke chapter 18, verse 10, and it reads, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a proud, self-righteous Pharisee and the other a cheating tax collector. The proud Pharisee prayed this prayer. Thank God I am not a sinner like everyone else, especially like that tax collector over there. For I never cheat. I don't commit adultery. I go without food twice a week, and I give to God a tenth of everything I earn. But the corrupt tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed, but beat upon his chest in sorrow, exclaiming, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, the sinner, not the Pharisee, will turn home forgiven. For the proud shall be humble, but the humble shall be honored. So there we see that you have the Pharisee that was like, I do all, I do X, Y, Z, and I'm not like that person over there that's, you know, messed up. They might be a drunk. They might be an adulterer. I don't do any of that. And it says that Jesus, not Jesus, I'm sorry, but it says that the tax collector was humble before God. Like, he wouldn't even look up to heaven and ask God for forgiveness. Like, he just kept his head low and was like, God, forgive me. You know, I am a sinner. I messed up. I don't get up right all the time, but please forgive me for my sins. That is the one that walked away forgiven for his sins because he was humble enough to say, I don't have it all together. I make mistakes. I mess up. I'm this, I'm that. But you're merciful and you will forgive me because I'm not perfect. Whereas the other person that's sitting there saying, I got myself together. Basically, I don't need your forgiveness because I'm perfect. That is pride. And that is why a lot of people don't go to church now because they feel judged by the people that are in the church because the people in the church and I've been to plenty of churches where they look down on you because you don't dress a certain way, you don't talk a certain way, you don't look a certain way, you don't act like this and you know all of that. And God is not looking for actors. He's looking for people that are truly after him. And it does not matter where you come. I don't care if right now if just 
five minutes before watching this video, you were having sex with somebody you're not married to. It does not matter. God loves you and he will take you and accept you the way that you are in your sin and all. As long as you are sincere and you really want to change and really want to live for him, he can work with that. And that's why he says, come to me the way that you are. You don't have to be perfect for me to come in and clean you up. So a lot of people, when they get saved, like when I got saved, I was not perfect. I was still doing things that I shouldn't have been doing, but I was sincere about wanting to change my life and give my life to God. And I came to him the way that I was. And then the Holy Spirit began to change me. He began to convict me on things, the things that I you know, used to do. I found, found that I couldn't do those things anymore. There was something keeping me from doing those things. And it was because of the Holy Spirit convicting me and saying, no, I'm changing you. You cannot do the things that you used to do. You can't talk the way that you used to talk. You can't go to places that you used to go to. So he is the one that will change you. You don't have to wait until, you know, you stop doing whatever it is. Come the way that you are. And if you're watching this and you're one of those religious people, you need to stop being religious. Just because you pray all these elaborate prayers and you fast and you don't do certain things, at the end of the day, you're still a sinner just like everybody else. Everybody sins every single day. That is why we constantly have to ask for forgiveness because we're human and we live in a sinful world. We're not going to get it right all the time. And if you have that religious, prideful spirit, God is not going to hear from you. He's not going to work with you with that because you are prideful and he has no part with pride. As you have seen, if you have a prideful spirit, you're going to fall. Like God is not going to be a part of that. He wants you to be humble and stop looking down on other people just because they don't talk like you or look like you or what have you. Love them and have compassion on them and see them the way that God sees them. And there's different types of pride, like I said, and it's not the kind of pride because I know that, you know, that there might be something, some goals or something that you have, uh, that you have achieved. And so you might say, I'm very proud of myself for losing this weight. I'm very proud of myself for, you know, going after this promotion or going after that or doing that. And you might have family or friends that say, I'm very proud of you for doing, you know, X, Y, Z. That is okay. That kind of saying that I'm proud of myself for doing something is okay. But it's the pride where you think that it's all because of you or you think that you're better than somebody else or you know, you forget about God and you take him out of the picture and you say, yeah, it's all about me. Yeah, I did do that. That was all me. That is where it becomes a sin. But you saying that I'm proud of myself, like me, I'm very proud of myself for writing the book that I wrote. But I understand that I wrote the book that I wrote because of God. It was God that gave me every single thing that I wrote in that book. You see, it's not like I'm saying, yeah, I did it. It was all me. No, it was God. Yeah, I'm the one staying up, you know, late writing, typing or whatever. But it's God that is telling me what to write. It's God that is giving me, you know, the ways to get it out there and all of that. So that's where it's different. Like Nebuchadnezzar took out the picture and said, I did all this. King Isaiah, same thing. I did all this. Haman, it's all about me. Look at all the wealth and things that I have. And there are plenty of other people. Loose up the devil. You know, look how beautiful I am. I should be the one getting all the glory. So that is the kind of pride that is dangerous. And it's a lot of people that, have, you know, are full of pride and think that it's all about them. And it is not. So if you're watching this and you are full of pride, I am telling you now that you need to repent of that pride and recognize that it is not you. It is God. God is the one that has given you everything you have. God is the one that got you in the position that you're in as far as like promotions and all of that stuff. It is nothing that you did. If you take God out of the picture, you will be nothing and you would have nothing. So make sure that you check that prideful spirit. The devil will love for you to get full of pride and he'll start talking in your ear. Look at, I believe this what happened with Nebuchadnezzar, Haman and all of them. The devil starts talking to them. Look at this. Look at what you did. You know, look at all the kingdoms and stuff that you have. Look at the army that you have. You did all of that. You're the one that, you know, went out and did this. I want God. It was you. You did. Like, the devil was hot to you. And then before you realize that you are the puffing your chest up, say, oh, yeah, I did. I did do all of that, didn't I? It was me. And that is what the devil wants. He wants you to get full of pride because it separates you 
from God and it will lead to your destruction. And he wants nothing more. The devil wants nothing more than to destroy you and take away everything that you have. So if you are not careful, you do, you will end up like the people in this Bible. Like God is not going to lie about his word. If he said that, you know, pride comes before destruction or destruction before um, a fall or pride or whatever, then it's going to happen. So you really have to be mindful of that. Like never forget that it was God that got you where you are and that blessed you with all that you have. So I hope that you guys got something out of this video. Um, I know it was long, but like I said, I really wanted you guys to grasp and fully understand how dangerous pride is. Um, so yes, if you did not read along with me in your Bible when I was reading it, make sure that you go back and read it all for yourself. And I'll make sure that I put it in the description box so that you guys can find all of those scriptures. Um, so yeah, I'll put my contact information, uh, email, social media, all of that great stuff. And I will see you guys next time. God bless. Bye.